that direction, and then we'll continue. Thanks so much. I think it's worth noting that that video we just watched, the bumper video for the sermon series, was also put together by middle schoolers. Uh, as you might notice uh, up there, how amazing you guys are. So thanks so much. Let's continue in prayer. God, thank you so much for the ways different uh, people in our congregation can serve in so many different ways. Thank you for those, Lord, who are just here this morning and encouraging one another by our presence and by singing. And thank you, Lord, for our uh, joy singers leading us with that song, for our worship team, for our tech people, our ushers, the list goes on. Thank you that we get to be a part of this together. Help us now as we listen for your word, that your spirit would lead us forward to actually live this life you've given us as you intend us to live it to your glory and as a blessing, God, to one another and to the world. Give us ears to hear, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So some of you know that I love basketball, and some of you probably have heard me talk about seminary when I was on an intramural basketball team, one of the highlights of my life, you know, on this intramural team that was just so much fun. And I carry with myself some regret about that because when it came to the final championship game of the season, we lost. And so I've always looked back at that as one of those failures you can't do anything about. You carry with you. We failed. We should have called a timeout. I'm sure we would have won if we just called a timeout or if just, you know. But there's nothing I can do about it. It's done. We failed. It wasn't until this past week as I was Meditating on the scripture for this morning, that it struck me. We didn't really fail at what mattered. We succeeded brilliantly. I'm going to have to carry that failure, that losing with me. But what I carry with me far more than that are these deep relationships that we formed during that season. That uh, these have been friends of mine now throughout the years since. I'll be friends with them until the day I die. These are deep friendships where we care about each other. We delight to hear from one another. We enjoy still seeing each other. Thank God for that success in what really matters. This is one of the issues for us in life is we have things that are important and then we have things that are really important, critically important. And sometimes we, we confuse the two. We don't realize what's most important. And as we talk about rekindling our faith, our sense of call, our life, our spiritual life in this sermon series, what we need to realize is that what it's all about, at the heart of it is relationship, that what we're talking about is kindling, rekindling our relationship with God and with each other, that this is what it's really all about. And so we look at different scriptures, and you, you hear this over and over again. Jesus, he, he says, this is how they'll know that you're my disciples. Anybody remember? By your love for one another. That's how they'll know. It's by your relationships. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. This is your true spiritual worship. And Immediately after, he goes on to talk about how we should 
love one another. Because if you're going to present yourself to God, if you're going to be alive in that relationship, well, then it's going to flow into your relationships with one another. It's just the way it goes. And so today we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 24. And this book, this letter of the Apostle Paul is actually the first letter that's written. If, if we were going to start with the first thing that's written, this would go ahead of Matthew. This is written probably 49, 51 AD. So only within 20 years or less of Jesus' death and resurrection. It's the first evidence we have of that early Christian community and of Paul's teaching. And as we come to the conclusion of the, the book in chapter 5, he's been doing this all along, but he really reinforces how we are called to live with each other, that this is what it's about. So I'm, I'm going to read this for you, chapter 5 of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, beginning verse 12. But we appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to respect those who labor among you and have charge of you in the Lord and admonish you, esteem them very highly in love because of their work, be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, beloved, to admonish the idlers. That's kind of the troublemakers in the congregation. Admonish them. Encourage the faint-hearted, those who are discouraged. Help the weak. Be patient with all of them. See that none of you repays evil for evil. But always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this letter of the Apostle Paul, written probably less than 20 years after Jesus has ascended to the Father after his resurrection, is one written to people who are beginning to wonder what's going on. Like when Jesus left, he says, I'm coming back, and he hasn't come back yet. And they're, they're beginning to struggle because some of their friends, their brothers and sisters in Christ have died. And they're wondering, uh, what's happened to them? Are they just dead and Jesus isn't going to take care of them? Or maybe if they went to be with Jesus in heaven, what happened about us? Is, you know, like, and Paul basically says, repeating what he says you already know, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. Nobody knows just when he's going to come. But stay awake, stay alert, because he is coming back. And as for those who go before you, and as for those who come after you, they're all going to meet together in the end with Jesus when he returns. You don't have to worry about this. You can be confident encouraged. Don't worry about this. Trust in God. Continue on with faith. He uses these words that you'll see in many of his writings. Faith, hope, and love. And then he launches into these almost final words in his letter. And what he does at the beginning is talk about how as a people of God, you've got to work together as a community. It's hard. It's worth noting that they were struggling even back then, the early Christians. We struggle too to be in community, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to admonish one another, to... I encourage the faint-hearted. I love that line where he, you know, he says, I see that none of you repays evil for evil. Maybe you could repeat that with me. See that none of you repays evil for evil. Going into a, an election year right now, or into whatever the challenges might be for you at workplace or at school or wherever it might be, See that none of you repays evil with evil. But rather always seek to do good to one another and to all. So repeat that one. Seek to do good to one another and to all. Seek to do good to one another and to all. That's just what we do. That's who we are. Whatever happens, that's who we are. That's what we do. We don't repay evil for evil. 
I mean, that's not our way of life, right? We follow Jesus. We seek to do good to all, to one another and to all. That's just what we do. And then right after that, he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then he continues on. Talks about, you know, not quenching the spirit, not despising the words of prophets, test everything, hold fast what's good, abstain from every form of evil. For me, it's just such a great word for us. When community gets challenging and we start to point fingers and think, well, those folks aren't worth listening to. Well, that guy's not worth listening to. I'm not going to listen to those folks. We stop, we quench the, like, God has always spoken through surprising people, through surprising experiences. So often people are going through the wilderness and not expecting to hear a word from God, and suddenly God speaks. And it doesn't always come like a burning bush. It doesn't always come from where we expect. Don't quench the spirit. Don't, uh, what is it? Don't um, despise the words of prophets. Like, you can listen. Take a breath. Test everything. Hold fast to what's good. Abstain from every form of evil. Like, this is a really important word for us to hear as we head into an election season where we're going to be all anxious about what those folks are saying. What those, like, it's okay. Take a breath. You can listen, think, test. Choose, move forward. When we have our relationships with one another, we can listen, take a breath, test everything, hold fast to what's good, abstain from every form of evil. It's okay. Because then he goes on to say, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Like, I, I just love that. The sanctify means to make us more and more like Jesus. That's what it means. We grow up more and more to be like Jesus. And it's the Holy Spirit that helps us do that. And it does not say, may the God of anxiety sanctify you. It doesn't say the God of fear make you more and more like Jesus. It doesn't say that at all. It says, may the God of peace sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do this. Take a breath. It's going to be okay. God will follow through. He's faithful. And so what's interesting is in this small section where we have him talking about living in community and doing good for one another, encouraging one another, being patient, in this place where he talks about listening and discerning and trusting God, right at the center of it are these three verses. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I think it's like a thermometer that we could take, right? That we could take our temperature. When we're not rejoicing in the Lord then we know something's wrong with our spirit. That something's broken in our relationship. It's time to rekindle that relationship. When we find ourselves not giving thanks in all circumstances, just note, remember, it's not for all circumstances, but in all circumstances, that God is with you, God's present, God's faithful, you can trust him in all circumstances, that when we find ourselves not able to give thanks, not able to rejoice in the Lord, it's like taking our temperature. We're running a fever. All is not well. And at the center of those two verses is prayer. When all is not well, when all is well, at the center of those two verses is prayer. Pray without ceasing. You see, it's the relationship with God that we need. We, we go through worship and we have different styles. We have ways of praying and different ones of us will pray differently. But all of it is about this thing. It's not about how we pray, how we worship. It's about the relationship with God. 
rekindling, rekindling that as we gather together to worship, as we pray. The relationship is what matters. And the, the crazy thing, the difficult thing, is that for all the churches that we have in the United States and in the world, for all the people who are going to church, many of us aren't feeling all that strong in our relationship with God, all that connected, all that alive. We're pretty good at the um, outward signs of religion. We can go to church. We can do the things. But we're kind of lonely, broken in our relationship with God too often. You know, the Star Tribune this past, this past month has been doing a series on loneliness, curing loneliness. The Surgeon General says that loneliness is at an epidemic level in our nation right now. That this uh, loneliness brings about uh, heart disease, strokes, dementia. That actually uh, the thing, the, the primary factor that research shows in people's happiness and their health is having close relationships with other people. And so many people, for all the different ways we have to connect over the internet, texting, whatever it might be, for all these different things that we have, even coming to church, but not really connecting closely with other people, we have more and more people who are lonely and more and more, actually, anxiety and issues going on in our world. It's a, an issue that we need to work on, and I appreciate, actually, this... this uh, Star Tribune series. If you look back over the last month, you'll be able to read up on it. But one of the things that they mentioned was this woman, Nina Badson, who is a local columnist, and she has a podcast on friendships. She had five things I'll just name to you real quickly that can be helpful for us as you think about how important it is. Just the primary driver of happiness and health is to have close relationships. So what can we do to help build those relationships? She lists five things. One is to remember it's not too late. That right now is a good time to go ahead and reach out to somebody. There's still pockets of people you haven't met. Here at church, there are people you haven't met, you haven't gotten to know. So join a small group, a life group, help usher, help out in the kitchen. You know, find a way to serve, go on a mission trip, like just... Try stuff, serve alongside others. It's not too late to begin building relationships right now. She said, be casual about it. Like, don't go into it to, to try to find your soulmate. <laughs> You're like, I, I need a best friend. Will you be my best friend? Will you be my, like, that's just too much pressure for you. It's too much pressure for the person you're trying to be. Just be, ca like, you know, if you start reaching out, giving opportunity, some of those relationships are very likely to build. In fact, what research shows is that it takes about 50 hours of interaction with somebody to become um, friends and about 200 to become really close, deep friends. So think about that, how much time it takes investment to develop relationships, but just be casual about it. Initiate, she says. It's always your turn. You know, if you're keeping score, like I think I've texted the last two times, eh, just text again, you know. Um, it's always your turn if you want to develop relationships. It says call or meet up. So while well, I mentioned texting is a good way to maybe initiate, it's so much better if you actually talk on the phone or better yet, take a walk or meet up for coffee, something like that. Being with people is important. And then finally she says, and I love this because she says take a risk on rekindling, which of course is our word, right? Rekindling. Take a risk on rekindling relationships. If a friend has drifted away, yeah, consider reaching out to them, reconnecting. It just doesn't hurt to try. You know, like us in our relationship with God, that's what we're calling one another, encouraging one another to do this Lent, is let's take a risk. Let's take a, an attempt at rekindling our relationship with God. You can't make it happen, but I tell you, you do the things we're talking about in this sermon series, you're going to find it happening. So here are five things that we can do to help us grow in our relationship with God with prayer at the heart of that. And so you'll be really surprised to know that the first thing on this list is the word pray. Like just take time to pray. Whether it's a minute, five minutes, 
20 minutes? The relationship is important. And so if you want to have a relationship with somebody in your life, a human being, you're going to have to take some time to invest in that relationship. If you want to have a relationship with God that's alive and living and powerful, take some time today to pray. Just do it. Try it. The second thing would be plan to pray. <laughs> so pray today, but plan to pray tomorrow. Don't make prayer the thing that, like, I'm hoping I'll be able to do tomorrow when I find time for it. No, start planning for tomorrow with prayer at the prior, as the priority. Make prayer, your relationship with God, your priority, and plan the rest of your day around that. The reading in the other service was, one of them was on the Ten Commandments, which, you know, keep the Sabbath is one of them. And the Sabbath never happens in our lives if we wait for it to happen. The only way you're going to have Sabbath in your life where you're going to be able to create a day that you have for rest with God, rejoicing, playing, relaxing, not working, the only way that's ever going to happen is if you plan for a day in which you're doing that. And that's true of prayer, too. To make it a part of our ongoing routine, to plan for it. Aim to be present, not impressive to God. Like when you come to pray, when you come to worship, don't try to be the greatest worshiper in the world. Don't try to be the greatest prayer. We hear about this. I'm going to be a prayer warrior. I'm going to be a spiritual giant. No. Don't try to be impressive. Just seek to be present to God. Remember, it's the God of peace who sanctifies, who helps us. If we just present ourselves to him, all bets are off. Wait and see what God will do. But if you're going to wait until you know how to pray before you start praying, if you're going to wait until you've got your act together, before, you, no, come to God to seek. The, God is present to you. I, I love this story about these disciples who go to the Holy One and they say, well, how do we find God? Where do we need to go? What do we need to do? And he says, I can't tell you. And they're like, well, what do you mean you can't tell? He says, no, it's like trying to tell a fish. You've got to find the ocean. Like God is right here. He's right with you. God is present to you. All we have to do is open our eyes, present ourselves to God who's always present to us. Focus on the relationship, not the routine. This gets back to the way we worship, too certainly with the way we prayed. You've got to pick a way to worship. Like we have a worship style in here. We've picked it. We're doing it the best we know how. We have another style in the sanctuary. we picked it. We're doing the best we can. But neither one of them are perfect, by the way. I have ways that I pray each day. None of them are perfect. But I've picked some ways, and I practiced them. But it's not about the routine. It's not about the way that I pray. It's about the relationship with God that what God's looking for from us is not perfection, but intention. That we would intend to connect with God. God meets us right there and says, let me help you. It's like a kid going to their parent. And the, the parents say, well, wait, you've got to get your words right. What are you really asking for? No, 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 don't sit on my lap yet. Wait, help, help, help. Come, sit on my lap. I'll help you learn how to talk. I'll help you learn how to breathe. I'll help you learn how to run. Just come and be with me. I love you. And God says that to us, just come, be present to me. God's faithful, he'll see you through, he'll help you. Focus on the relationship, not the routine. Come here to worship God, not to go through the motions of some religion, but to seek God. And finally, just pray and be open to what God wants to do. Just pray and be open to what God wants to do. You'd be amazed if you just are still with God, how this God of peace can work through you. We pray for peace in our world, but if we breathe in the God of peace, if we present ourselves to the God of peace, we become peace in the world. And everywhere we go, we bring peace wherever we go. We are people of peace, with the God of peace living in us and present through us in the world. This is what our world needs. Not people who try harder to 
make peace happen. But peace, people who open up their hearts and their spirits to the God of peace being present through them in the world. So I want to encourage you this week to take time for prayer. This week to pick a way of praying. You know, there are a lot of different ones, acronyms you can use. We have a brochure uh, for Lent right now that's here or out in the lobby that you can take a look at that has some ideas. We have on our website some resource section, a resource, sorry, a resource section, that's how you say it, um, that you can click on, and there's some great ideas there. There are some great apps and websites, and if you have questions, you can ask me or just ask a number of people around here. They'll be happy to give you some ideas. But just choose something and practice it this week. Five minutes, 20 minutes, each day, practice. And finally, one that I'll just throw out there to you that I'd encourage you to try this week is what's called a breath prayer. It's, it's, you can use any number of words or no words at all when you do it. But for me, it has transformed my life. This is the thing that helps me to pray without ceasing because my very breath, my every breath becomes a prayer. I sit each day still with God. I breathe in and I breathe out. Do you ever do that in the day where you breathe in and out? Your breath can be a prayer. And so one way to do that, that just encourage you to try out this week, would be when you breathe in to say, thank you, Lord. Maybe you'd set your feet flat on the ground, your hands in an open position before God. Thank you, Lord. Do it for a minute or two. Just try it. Ask God to help your breath become a prayer. So that, you know, for me, I've been in, if you can believe it, some tense meetings from time to time. And I can take a breath and breathe in the Holy Spirit and breathe out God's peace, God's blessing, whether anybody notices it or not, <laughs> to the room, to the world, to the people I'm with. God is with us all the time. All the time, God is with us. God is with us all the time. All the time, God is with us. So breathe in his presence. Breathe out your thanksgiving. Practicing this will help you to pray without ceasing, to rejoice in the Lord always, to give thanks in all circumstances, because God is with you. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much that you are here in this room right now. That you are like the ocean swirling around us and we get to swim and live in your presence. You are, oh God, the air that we breathe. We can breathe your very presence into our lungs, into our hearts, into our lives. And we can breathe you out, your peace and your love into this community and into this world. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.